We have machines doing a lot of the physical labor for us. And we have the technology that has allowed us to drugify almost every human experience. So even things like food um, and human connection, you know, things that release dopamine and are fundamentally healthy have become drugified. Welcome to the Spartan Up podcast, hosted by Joe DeSena, founder and CEO of Spartan Race and brought to you by Wild Health. We are talking about overcoming obstacles. The same way we teach people to get over obstacles on the course, we will teach you here on the Spartan Up podcast to get over obstacles in your mind. Get fully personalized health care based on your DNA, biometrics, and blood work with Wild Health, the official health care provider of Spartan. Go to wildhealth.com and use the code SPARTAN10 to save 10%. This episode of Spartan Up is brought to you by Duralane, a single injection that may provide up to six months relief from osteoarthritis knee pain. Risks can include general knee pain and pain at the injection site. You can see full prescribing information at Duralane.com. Joe DeSena here, CEO and founder of Spartan. I got a big one for you. This might be our best podcast. I don't know. We've done 500 plus podcasts. We've been doing this forever. Dr. Anna Lamke. And she is... Are you the head of psychiatry and behavioral sciences at Stanford, or you should be? <laughs> no, I am, the, I am the head of addiction in the Department of Psychiatry. And, and we are an addicted nation. Is that, is that what you're, you, you found when you've done your work? Yes, I think that's a, a fair way to put it. Do you think we've always been like addicted to something? No, you know, for as long as our species has been on the planet, we, we seek, uh, we're pleasure seekers. Absolutely. I mean, we're wired to be addicted in a sense. I mean, when I use the word addicted, it's a, it's a word that denotes a form of psychopathology. So we're not wired to be sick, but we're wired to be seekers. The problem is that we've changed our environment. And instead of living in this world of scarcity and ever-present danger, we are now living in a world of overwhelming abundance. And we're, we're, our wiring is mismatched for this kind of ecosystem. So if you and I, let's back up like 5,000 years. You and I are, are on the plains. Uh, we're in Greece. And it's been, you know, a famine. It's been tough. There's been a famine and we stumble upon some orange groves. Do we stay there and eat oranges until like we turn orange? You know, we're homo sapiens, so we're smart. So we're probably not going to um, eat all of the oranges all at once. But we will fight, probably fight to the death to somehow keep and preserve all the oranges for our particular uh, group that's, you know, nomadically uh, tra traversing, you know, the, the plains or the mountains or whatever of Greece. And, and so for most of our existence on the planet as, you know, our species, have we been in like a deficit where we're always like struggling a little bit and, and trying to like get ahead and not die by 32 years old? And, and is, is the thesis, which by the way, I'm 100% aligned with, but I, but I, I want to just make sure, I want to make yeah. sure your studies prove what I, what I think, which is, and now it's flip-flop. The pendulum has swung to their side. Now there's just so much of an abundance that we have too much. Yeah, yeah. so that's exactly right. I mean, we are... We are evolved over millions of years of evolution to seek pleasure and avoid pain. And that is absolutely how we need to be wired in order to survive in a world in which we have to traverse tens of kilometers every day just to find food, clothing, shelter. Um, and we have to watch out constantly for predators, which are lurking behind you know, every rock. And that wiring hasn't changed. It's been preserved over millions of years of evolution. It's essentially the same across species. So if you dissect a human brain and you look at the part of the, the brain that is intimately involved in seeking out reward or the reward pathways, which is deep in our limbic midbrain, which is sometimes called the lizard brain because it's so old, that part of our brain looks identical to that part of the brain in every single animal um, you know, that you will look at, and in every single advanced animal. And even in primitive worms, there are echoes um, of that reward system. For example, 
um, a nematode, a nematode will release dopamine in response to food in the environment, and that dopamine allows the nematode to locomote to get the food. So the, the bottom line is that this wiring was great, you know, when we had to work really hard um, just to survive. It's very maladaptive for the world we have now, where we have tons of time, tons of leisure, relatively speaking, more disposable income for luxury goods than humans have ever had, including the poorest of the poor. We have machines doing a lot of the physical labor for us, and we have the technology that has allowed us to drugify almost every human experience. So even things like food um, and human connection, you know, things that release dopamine and are fundamentally healthy, have become drugified. They've been made more plentiful, more potent, um, more novel, you know, more compelling, harder to stop once we once we start consuming. So, so what happens? I mean, it, it doesn't seem like uh, we're going to reverse course. We're not going to get rid of the phones and hand everybody a brick. Like, what what happens? Does the body and the mind, uh, five thousand years from now, start to adapt a little bit? You know, one of the hallmarks of humans is our ability to adapt to changing circumstances. That's what has made us, I think, the dominant species for so long. Um, on the other hand, you know, I, I don't think, I think we will kill ourselves before, um, you know, our brain is going to actually fundamentally change this, this kind of reward system. I think what needs to happen is that indeed we need to kind of change the way, intentionally change the way that we live, um, you know, in order to uh, make it in, in this world of plenty. So um, I was really lucky. I don't, I don't think a lot of kids um, had a mom like I did where, you know, she stumbled upon a yogi in the 1970s who was preaching the stuff you, you've studied and you've, you've researched. And it was, I watched her actually throw away possessions in the house, like, just throw things away that we liked. Mm. And, um, but anyway, she had this belief system. And so I got a little taste of it as a kid. And so at least I'm open-minded to this. Fast forward, you might not know this, but um, I started this thing called Spartan Race. And, and the idea was to actually um, knock people down a few rungs, you know, remove the phone, get rid of the, uh, the ice cream, the cookie. Mm. And, and let's crawl under barbed wire and suffer a little bit, not because I want to hurt people, but because, uh, again, thinking about my mother's teachings, uh, it made you appreciate when you get to the finish line. It makes you, I did, I did a lot of races myself, makes you appreciate the stuff you have. Yeah. Does that make sense? Or, or, or is it really just a dopamine hit the barbed wire? Um, well, I mean, both things are true. So, you know, the wisdom that's been present in religious philosophical traditions, including the one your mother stumbled on for thousands of years, is now um, being proven true by the neuroscience. If this is not new wisdom, it's just that now we have science to show what's going on in the brain. And your Spartan race is you're, you're tapping into the very kind of thing that, you know, that I recommend um, based on the neuroscience. So let's talk about what's happening in the brain. Basically, the same parts, one of the, the most interesting advances in neuroscience in the last 75 years is that the same parts of the brain that process pleasure also process pain, and they work like opposite sides of a balance. So when we do something pleasurable, we tip one way, painful, we, we tip the other. But one of the overarching rules governing this balance is that it wants to remain level. It doesn't want to be tipped for very long to the side of pleasure or pain. And our brains and bodies will work very hard to restore this level balance or what neuroscientists call homeostasis. But here's the key. We restore homeostasis first by tipping an equal and opposite amount to whatever the initial stimulus was. So when we do something pleasurable, we tip to the side of pleasure, we release dopamine, our reward neurotransmitter in this reward part of our brain, this reward circuit, and it feels good, right? But no sooner has that happened than our brain adapts to the increased dopamine by decreasing dopamine production and transmission, not just to baseline, but below baseline. I like to imagine that as these neuroadaptation gremlins hopping on the pain side of the balance to bring it level again, but they like it on the balance, so they stay on until we're tipped an equal and opposite amount to the side of pain. That's the come down, the after effect. 
hangover. Now, if we wait long enough, those gremlins hop off, that feeling passes, and homeostasis is restored. But if we continue to expose our reward pathway repeatedly with feel-good drugs and behaviors, which are now at our fingertips, we essentially go to war with our gremlins, and we start to get more and more gremlins on the pain side of the balance. That means that the initial response to pleasure is shorter and weaker, but that after response to pain is stronger and longer. And ultimately, we end up in a dopamine deficit state. And this is the neuroscience of addiction. What happens in the brain when people get addicted? They essentially end up with enough gremlins on the pain side of their balance to fill this whole room. Now they need to use not to get high, but just to feel normal. And when they're not using, they're, in, they're experiencing the universal symptoms of withdrawal from any addictive substance, which are anxiety, irritability, insomnia, dysphoria, and craving. I have had more and more people over the past 25 years come to my office seeking help for anxiety, depression, insomnia. And I used to prescribe a pill or prescribe psychotherapy. Now what I do first pass is I say, find out what your drug is, that thing that you're compulsively overusing. Once you start, you can't stop and eliminate it for 30 days. Why 30 days? Because the science shows, and it's consistent with my clinical experience, that 30 days is the minimum amount of time it takes for those gremlins to hop off of the pain side of the balance and for homeostasis to be restored. And it's essential to restore homeostasis in order to be able to clear your mind and see true cause and effect and say, oh my gosh, what the heck was that that I was doing, right? But also to be able to enjoy more modest rewards. And the vast majority of my patients who do this will come back a month later and feel incredibly better, better than they have in a long time. Then the question becomes, okay, do they want to maintain abstinence or do they want to go back to using in moderation? And then in my book, I talk all about how we have to then engage in self-binding strategies to help us moderate. But to your point, we can also press intentionally on the pain side of the balance because those gremlins are agnostic to which side they jump on. If we press on pleasure, they're going to jump on pain. But if we start with pain as the initial stimulus, like your Spartan race, those gremlins will hop on the pleasure side of the balance in order to restore homeostasis. And what we're essentially doing is telling our body, oh, there's an injury here, or there's potential danger here, or my life is potentially threatened. I need to upregulate dopamine and dopamine transmission and those other feel-good hormones. And it's persistent, right? So after we exercise, dopamine levels slowly rise and stay elevated for hours afterwards before going back to baseline. There is no dopamine deficit state because we paid it up front, right? We paid it with the pain that it took to do the exercise in the first place. And it's not just exercise that can give us that healthy dopamine. It's also ice cold water baths, intermittent fasting, or even um, emotionally and cognitively challenging things like. Um, you know, trying to tell the truth, go through the whole day and not lie. Because we're all natural liars. The average adult tells one to two lies per day. So telling the truth is effortful. We're forcing ourselves to interact with people, which a lot of people struggle with now, right? I talk about a patient who has social phobia and he can't even go out and talk to people. So his homework was to go to Starbucks and order coffee, talking to the barista and not using the app. So, you know, it starts small, but you build up from there. I love this. I mean, there, we could have separate splintered off podcasts. I love, I didn't know Californians lie on average twice. What do politicians do? <laughs> not, not just Californians, not just Californians. <laughs> how, how about politicians? Are they like six or seven times? Yeah, they're probably a whole different scale. <laughs> um, so that's interesting. So you do something hard. So I've always had in my head, because I'm trying to explain, you know, to civilians that don't have the research you have, that don't have the degree you have, and I've, I've come up with this image. You tell me if I'm crazy, but imagine life is a, is a horizontal line on a whiteboard, and that's kind of homeostasis, that's optimal. And we're in our first world where we have everything, like you described, we're trying to get above and above that line constantly. And you can never get satisfied because whatever you have, you want more, you want more. And I say, I'd rather go below the line. And then when I come back to the line, I am so happy you know, the ancient samurai, the story, stories I've read, the ancient samurai at night when they would go to bed, they would close their eyes and they would burn all their possessions, their family, everything in their mind. When they woke up in the morning, they were so happy with everything they had. <laughs> right. So it's a little bit of that, you know? 
Yeah, no, it's great. I love that image. And of course, you've anticipated the neuroscience and you're echoing the wisdom of the ages. I think the one thing to be aware of, which is also a very modern phenomenon, just like we don't want to constantly press on the pleasure side because it's just going to accumulate more gremlins on the pain side and we're going to be in that dopamine deficit state. But also, it's possible to get addicted to pain. So if we press too hard and too fast on that pain side, our gremlins get pretty confused and they won't just perpetually hop on the pleasure side. Basically, once you turn the volume up on pain, it acts, it can act like an intoxicant. There's a very famous experiment where if you inject a rat with cocaine and then look at its brain, you will see this incredible arborization of dopamine releasing neurons in the brain's reward pathway. Now, if you subject a rat to an incredibly painful foot shock and look at its brain, you will see the exact same arborization of dopamine releasing neurons in the pleasure pathway or the reward pathway. Why is that? Because basically that level of intensity of pain tells the body, flood me with dopamine, just get it all out there because I'm about to die, right? Um, but then you've depleted everything. And so then you're essentially you know, in, in that dopamine deficit state and you're chasing it. So the secret is to keep the body guessing enough that you maintain that dopamine balance and you're not getting into that dopamine deficit state with the gremlins on the pain side, but you're not overdoing it um, by intentionally pressing on the pain side so that, you know, you're kind of getting to this, this sort of, uh, well, basically get addicted to pain. The other thing to keep in mind is that the biological definition of stress is any deviation from baseline neutrality. So whenever you're having to work to restore homeostasis, you're basically releasing cortisol, which is, you know, our body's stress hormone. So, you know, a little bit of stress is good. We've seen that in lots of different animal studies. If you have no stress, that's not good. Too much stress, bad. But you want to make sure it's an optimal amount of stress and that you're not overdoing it. The other big thing that happens now in the modern day is what I call this work hard, work hard, play hard. So people will really push themselves either physically or in their professions. And then at the end of the day, they will really reward themselves. Now you've got a balance that's going boom, 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 boom. And that's no good either. Because remember, it's stressful every time you have to restore homeostasis. So now you've got a system that's, you know, yeah, you're working hard, but then you're playing hard and you're really, you know, you're torquing this balance and eventually it's going to give out. We'll be right back to this episode, but first a quick word from our partner, Wild Health. You want to live like a Spartan, whether you're on the course or off. Take control of your health with Wild Health. They're the official healthcare provider for Spartan. They use DNA, blood work, your lifestyle, and so much more so that you can get truly personalized health care. Healthcare focused on performance. You'll learn about optimal diet, about exercise, sleep routines, and how to prevent chronic disease. Sign up at wildhealth.com with the code SPARTAN10 to save 10%. You know that knee pain can really slow you down. Sometimes that knee pain is due to osteoarthritis, a disease that affects some 14 million Americans. Learn about osteoarthritis knee pain and how to alleviate it at oaneepainrelief.com. One treatment you'll find there is Doralane, a single injection that may provide up to six months of relief from osteoarthritis knee pain. It's indicated for the treatment of mild to moderate osteoarthritis knee pain when conservative treatments have not worked. Risks can include general knee pain and pain at the injection site. Full prescribing information is at doralane.com. You can learn more at oaneepainrelief.com. That's oaneepainrelief.com. I think a lot about um, homeostasis and and what normal is. And, And like you just said, a little bit of stress is good, but not too much. But normal has changed. Like, yeah. like normal used to be maybe 32 degrees in the house. Normal is now 72 degrees, right? A, a shower used to be whatever. Uh, the amount of food used to be whatever. So, so isn't that dangerous because normal just keeps moving us somewhat in the wrong direction? Well, yeah. And the whole message of Dopamine Nation is that we, we have such a messed up definition of normal that we have to redefine it. And we, ha- we have such a phobia of pain, you know, not your, your group or your acolytes, but I can tell you the average patient that I see, it's hard for them to get up and off of the couch and just walk to the refrigerator, right? Um, so we have to completely rethink 
what we think about is as painful. And in fact, we have to intentionally seek out and invite pain into our lives. Yeah, Physical because... pain, emotional pain. This is really key to living in a world that's overloaded with dopamine. Yeah, because I what I think about is... If I go out and do a Spartan race, it could be anything, a 10K, a marathon, right? It doesn't matter. Or learn a new language. Um, it's painful, just like the, the rat getting shocked on the foot. And it's way, it's way out there compared to normal. But after studying the language for a while or doing the races for a while, then that becomes your new normal. Right. Right. So it's, it's, that's right. And that's what neuroscientists call neuroadaptation. And that's the gremlins. The gremlins represent neuroadaptation. So if you press on that pain side of balance, they will adapt by going on the pleasure side and you'll reset your pleasure pain balance to the side of pleasure so that you really feel much better. Yeah. So if it's not an unhealthy activity, if it's not right. drugs or getting electric shocks to your feet or, right. or standing, um, or cutting on yourself, or cutting on yourself. Mm -hmm. You know, if it's a healthy one, right? a little bit of fasting is probably, right? Like yep. you probably just want to keep leaning that way because... That's right. Right? Yeah. And that, that's exactly right. So, you know, Buddha talked about the middle path. But what I say in my book is that the middle path has been adulterated by our culture of hyperconvenience. So what we, in fact, have to do now is to veer slightly off the middle toward pain in order to compensate for this ecosystem in which, you know, we have these highly reinforcing drugs and behaviors wherever we I turn. love that you're saying it because I have two really smart friends that, and I think you're smarter than they are. And, um, <laughs> I'll take it. <laughs> and they um, just aren't buying, we're very good friends, but they're just not buying into like, they, they're saying to me is, Joe, no pain, no pain. Forget about this idea of no pain, no pain, <laughs> no pain, no pain. And, and I love that now I can introduce a scientist a yeah. doctor to them and say, listen, um, you know, you and I, I think would be recommending more couches if this was 5,000 years ago, more Netflix, <laughs> right? We'd right. be leaning the other way. Um, yeah. The last thing um, I will tell you, we have a, an annual death camp, a children's death camp, which I know sounds ridiculous. It's not good branding. Probably not. <laughs> um, but I do it um, because I want the parents that are willing to send their kids to know what they're getting into. And and the reality is it's just, again, because our lives are so simple and so soft, um, 5,000 years ago, they would laugh at my camp and say, what is that, soft right. camp, right? <laughs> um, but, but I love they, that, you're, that you're not afraid to kind of embrace a word like death. That, that's great. I yeah. love it. And because we're all going to die, and, yeah. and um, let's have the discussion and, and make sure we're tough enough to handle it and, and death around us. But, but what's interesting, by accident, I did this study, I think you – I find fascinating is um, they didn't have their phones, which is obviously they get a dopamine hit from their phones. We all do. Right. right? And they didn't have a lot of food. They're, they're eating just healthy food three times a day and they're working 14 hours a day. And one night I said, you know what? They've done such a great job. The kids are so good. Let's let them use their phones for now. Let's get them some ice cream. We put the ice cream out. We put the phones out. I didn't expect this, but they went to their phones completely forgetting about the ice cream. The ice cream all melted. Wow. They clearly wanted the ice cream, but, but that just goes to show you the phones win. The potency of the phone, yeah. Yeah, no. I mean, it's really important to understand that the phone and everything on it is a drug. It absolutely is a drug. It releases so much dopamine. It's just perfectly designed. The phone itself has evolved to capture us, right? So we really have to have a deeply healthy respect for the extent of our innate attraction to this device. It doesn't mean we should throw them all away. That's not going to happen, even if I wanted it to. But we have to have that kind of healthy respect for the extent to which we have evolved and the phones have evolved in a, in a concert, in concert, to just keep us absolutely gripped, just like nicotine, you know, keeps us, once we, you know, started smoking, very hard to stop. And any other drug you think about. So what I'm suggesting to folks is realize that, have a healthy respect for it, own the ways in which we are compulsively over consuming um, these devices. Set a goal of quitting either a specific website or maybe it's YouTube, maybe it's a video game, maybe it's a social media site, um, you know, putting it away for a month 
and letting your brain recalibrate and then coming back to it with a much clearer sensorium and a much deeper appreciation of the extent to which we really are addicted to these devices. Because often we can't see it until we try to stop and experience the withdrawal, the anxiety, the restlessness, the craving, the intrusive thoughts, the FOMO, right? FOMO to me, fear of missing out, is really just withdrawal. It's our brains making up a story for why we need to re-engage that's not true. And then, you know, when we finish that month and feel better, think about, okay, well, you know, how do I want to spend the rest of my time on this earth? Do I really want to spend four hours a day on my device? Good Lord, that's a lot of, you know, that's a, a third of my waking life. That's kind of scary. And then, you know, putting in these, these building blocks and then also creating a life in real life that has us challenged and engaged in a way that's vital and, and appealing and allows us to be present so that we're not always wanting to go back to this virtual life. You know, if you're listening to this or you're watching it, I, I love your thoughts on, I was very young and I had a business in, in my teens and um, I would meet a kid every day that was going to help me do the job. We, we would clean swimming pools and I couldn't help. You're in conversation because you're cleaning pools and you're with this person all day. And I was shocked that some of these young kids, this is, you know, back in the late eighties, early nineties, and they would say, oh, they're depressed or this or that. And I thought, yeah. I thought to myself, like, I don't have time to be depressed. I'm so busy. <laughs> I'm, 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 no, but, but it's, I'm not even making a joke. Like I legitimately thought that. And then, so then I said, because then I started working with like third world country uh, folks would come like Polish it, we're, were migrating yeah. to the country and they Maybe became, they became my partners and employees. And I would, and I said, there's no psychologists in mm -hmm. Poland or in, like, I don't understand. Do they, are they not depressed? So what are your thoughts on that? Oh, this is so, this breaks my heart. You know, this is really why I wrote Dopamine Nation. I have seen more and more young people in the past two decades who can barely get out of bed in the morning. And then on top of that, they experience the tremendous guilt because they are incredibly wealthy they have loving parents. They've been to the best schools. They have every resource, including every mental health resource, right? And they're miserable and they're guilty about being miserable. And they're playing video games all day and they're on social media all day. And th there's just this kind of great lassitude that overwhelms them that I directly attribute to this dopamine imbalance and the ways in which after bombarding their reward pathways, which all of these drugified things, they're, in a, they're literally in a clinical depression because they're in a dopamine deficit state. And what they need is not more comfort or reassurance or, you know, sort of traditional help in the way that we usually offer it in mental health. They need a challenge. They need meaning and purpose. They need to strive. They need to experience pain. Um, and they need to stop doing the things that are giving them so much immediate pleasure so they can restore a healthy balance. I um, I have a farm in Vermont that I, where I do the, the children's camp I just described. And over 22 years, I've been bringing people up and doing exactly what you just described and, and helping them find purpose. And in those 22 years, no less than 100 extremely wealthy people, many of them billionaires, have sent me their kids. Obviously, easier for me to work with kids in their teens than it is once they're 22, you know, 24, 25. But, um, but I'm always scratching my head and saying, oh, my God, if, if anybody else from Poland or Chile or, or Europe, or you the name Ukraine it, or the Ukraine. Ukraine had that leg up, what would they do with it? Right. And, and so um, it's a shame. There's a saying I, 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 I'm led to believe there's an ancient saying where they would say, like, the best thing you could do for your kids is like not be successful. Is that a create, you know, but you could see there's something there, but it's probably not. Yeah. Well, sadly, there's now a term here in Silicon Valley called the fail son, which is a terrible term, but it basically describes this, you know, fairly common phenomenon of sons of billionaires, these, you know, tech billionaires who are really bright, gifted people, but who sort of can't, can't sort of get it together, you know, um, really sad. How would they? 
Right, when they don't have to and when everything is sort of handed to them, including, again, um, trying to protect them from emotional turmoil, right? Um, when what they really need is like to figure it out for themselves and to do things that are hard and frankly, to get off of their computers. Tell me about your book. I know it's a lot more famous and successful than my book. <laughs> it should be everywhere. <laughs> Yeah, so it's called Dopamine Nation, Finding Balance in the Age of Indulgence. And it basically talks about the neuroscience of what's going on in our brains as we process pleasure and pain, how pleasure and pain work like a balance, how we're in this dopamine overloaded world so that we have to be mindful of that balance and in fact seek out painful things in order to restore uh, baseline dopamine firing. Um, and it's very, it's quite prescriptive and it gives a lot of information based on patient stories, people I've treated over the years with their very generous permission. Well, if you want to start writing prescriptions for Spartan, right, <laughs> there's no charge. I, I won't charge the insurance company or anything. I just want to be right. a good American. Yeah. It's no, no. Well, I actually do write such prescriptions. I write prescriptions for truth telling. I write prescriptions for exercise. I write prescriptions for ice cold water bath and intermittent fasting. I do write those prescriptions. Well, we do it all. It could be like it's one. It's a one-stop drugstore at Spartan. Great. <laughs> we check. How all do I phone. connect people? I just say go, Spartan.com or something. Yeah, my my email is Joe J O E at Spartan.com. The whole world knows it. Joe at Spartan.com. Okay. And you could literally put it on the prescription, and you just say Joe's my friend. There's no charge. Okay. Um, great. And I just want to help people. I and you help. Will you help young people, like teenagers who are playing video games? I help. I help somebody? everybody. Um, I'm going to okay. read you something I got, and I'm not kidding. I got this today, and I get tens of thousands of these. Hang That's on, my great. phone. My phone is frozen. It's probably testing my my dopamine. Um, <laughs> Your withdrawal. Um, Your ability to be in withdrawal. Okay, so. This is a guy I had no idea until this morning, and it, it's just bizarre that it's timed with, with today. Um, this guy had experiences that um, he got addicted to opioids, which I didn't know. He's a friend of mine. Mm -hmm. It's an absolute epidemic in our country, he writes. It's taken down athletes, CEOs, corporations, families, rich, poor, it doesn't care who you are. He says, Joe, you helped me destroy it. I'm strong now. I'm the happiest I've ever been, spiritually, physically, emotionally. I never told you this. I just need you to know you helped oh, me get off. Right? Wow. That's so, very, very moving. It's so wonderful. I get a lot of, but I don't get a lot of opioid. It's bizarre that I got it today and I'm talking to yeah. you. So yeah. um, thanks for doing this. Thanks for taking sure, the Sure, happy to. Do you know someone who needs a little help staying motivated, staying informed, getting or staying mentally and physically resilient? We're here three days every week with a mix of content to help you stay strong from mindset to nutrition and everything in between. Listen every Tuesday to hear Joe DeSena, Spartan Race founder and CEO, and the rest of the week, join us for DECA, endurance and classic episodes. See you next time. Maximize energy, optimize nutrition, and improve performance with Wild Health. Personalized precision healthcare built for Spartans. You'll get a personalized health plan based on your DNA and biometrics and the support of a team of health experts. Sign up at wildhealth.com with the code SPARTAN10 to save 10%. This episode of Spartan Up is brought to you by Duralane, a single injection that may provide up to six months relief from osteoarthritis knee pain. Risks can include general knee pain and pain at the injection site. You can see full prescribing information at Duralane.com.